So um, I guess I should start off with my creds, um, which Evelyn has uh, alluded to. I've worked on phages for, let's put it this way, over 50 years, and I've uh, worked on the sequences of them for over 25 years, and we've now got uh, 130 plus phages um, sequence. Not all the ones in GenBank that you'll find with my name on it, because some of them were in fact sequenced for companies. And I apologize to the Unix and uh, Linux people in the crowd because I'm a Windows, Mac, and internet type of bioinformatician. And I'm generally a default setting bioinformatician. Okay, so by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to understand the steps involved in fully annotating phage genomes. And you'll have an authoritative list of internet resources and software, both commercial and as much as possible freeware. And for the first part, I'm going to deal with genes. And there's two types of genes that you'll find in, in phages, uh, the common ones, which be transfer RNA encoding sequences, and a subset of ORFs, which are referred to as CDSs or coding sequences, which are the genes which encode for proteins. And I'll say this right out front, these don't overlap with one another. Uh, so if you find a CDS which has a tRNA in, in the middle of it, uh, it probably doesn't exist. Uh, that being said, Mother Nature continually throws curves at us and exceptions to rules are always present, with, particularly with phages. tRNAs are usually drawn in this cloverleaf formation and can be found using two really good tools online, one being tRNA scan. Uh, which is certainly one of the oldest uh, programs available on the internet, and Aragorn. And please note that if you're using automatic annotation, and in this case, I'm definitely saying my RAST as being one of the tools, uh, it doesn't always show you the tRNAs. Plus, you want to look and make sure that the tRNA is in fact complete. Some programs miss the terminal CAA residues and so you want to make sure that when it records the tRNA, it is in fact a complete actual phage tRNA. Okay, so ORFs versus CDSs. An ORF is a sequence divisible by three, which is bounded by stop codons. Stop codons are universal, and it may or may not encode a protein. The difference is with a codon, with a coding sequence, is there will be a start codon up front, usually ATG or GTG, sometimes TTG, and sometimes these other ones. So they are rare, but they do occur. Um, so the coding sequence, in fact, is the region, is, as, I said, as I said, a subset of ORFs, which in fact encodes for proteins. Uh, most um, automatic annotation systems Look, for look at ORFs which are greater than 100 or greater than 150 nucleotides. In the case of phages, which have a lot of smaller um, coding sequences, I would use a minimum of 75 nucleotides as the cutoff. Here's a piece of software which I don't recommend you use. <laughs> it's ORF Finder. It's nice. It shows you useful information. But uh, this is, in fact, a region which I happen to know only has one coding region in it. And yet, if you look for open reading frames, you will find vast numbers going in from right to left and left to right. And the question, of course, comes to your mind is, which of these is truly the coding sequence? So lots of potential, which is the real one that you want to deal with? And I will say, firstly, that experience, after you've done this a number of times, you'll find that it's really, it's relatively easy to pick out the CDSs from the ORPs. That being said, that some of the cyanobacterial phages I've looked at, I don't know how they managed to get them annotated because they, the coding sequences were really difficult to identify. The 
characteristic of a coding sequence is that upstream from the start codon, you will find a stretch of nucleotides which bears sequence similarity to the sequence here, the GGA, GGT, uh, which is referred to as the ribosome binding site or the Shine-Algano sequence or box. So that's this is your hint when looking at anyone, if you wanted to examine any of these, you would in fact look, does this off here have this upstream? If it doesn't, then it is just an off, it's not a CDS. These are some examples at the RNA level of the ribosome binding sites relative to the initiation codons. And it doesn't really matter which initiation codon you're using, whether it's methionine or valine or isoleucine, leucine. The first amino acid to be incorporated is always methionine. And so when you look at GenBank records, you'll find your gene does begin with, say, a TTG but the protein will always have a methionine up front. Okay, so as far as the arrangement of genes on the genome, the most common systems you will see are ones in which there's a small gap between the two coding sequences or the uh, genes, the coding sequences actually overlap by a, a limited number of nucleotides. Or occasionally you'll see, and this is what you want to see when in fact there are two transcribed so from left to right and from right to left, where they meet, there's probably going to be some sort of termination signal in the DNA RNA, preventing the transcription from through this region and through this region, which would nullify the expression of those genes. Okay, so th those are the usual case. Now there are some, and they are, must admit, are relatively rare cases where in fact, OFFs can be heavily overlaid overlapped with other genes. So in the case of mu and lambda, we have these two genes here, which are buried within the uh, capsid synthesis gene. And in addition, another common one is to find the RZ gene heavily overlapped with the RZ gene. So this is, this is so other than these two cases, uh, most genes look like the previous diagram. There's if you are unfortunate enough to work on Campylobacter uh, and to a lesser extent on Staphylococcus phages, you will also run into intines and introns. And these are, these are kind of fun. Um, so it, what you will find is say your part of your terminase gene will be on one off, another part will be on another off. And in between you'll find a third off, which in fact, frequently will code a, a homing endonuclease. And so in order to get the complete protein, you will in fact have to splice this information. Um, one really weird case uh, that, that I ran into is where we found essentially nine kilobases between this part and that part. But that is even rarer, but as I said, don't work on Campylobacter pages. In the case of some other phages, you will find intines. So you have a single gene being transcribed and translated into a polyprotein, and then the intine will uh, excise out of the polyprotein, producing a normal length. And these type of things show up when, in fact, you've got high degree of homology separated by this gray line when you do a fast search. And the only other thing I can add about this, other than the fact that doing Finding these things is, is relatively easy. Recording them is somewhat tedious. In the case of NCBI databases, you want to, in fact, include a line in your annotation which says join, join this to that and translate it, and that will be your protein. Okay, so good place to start is I can't even see the top of the slide, but no, maybe I can drag this down. I can, good. Okay, good place to start is with automatic annotation. You can annotate things manually if you want. You can annotate them using online tools and add them to a growing file. But I find automatic annotation is now a good way to start. Okay, unfortunately, so far in the case of uh, internet 
in the case of um, Windows and um, Mac computers, there's no phase specific pipeline available. But there are three good places to start. There's Rast and uh, Patrick, both of which require free annotation. And there's my favorite, which is called DFAST. And it's my favorite because I found in the case of Rast, frequently I get put into a queue and the queue has lasted as long as a week in order to get my annotation back. DFAST, I usually submit and get a notification that it's complete within 15 minutes. And it doesn't matter which program you use, you want an output file, which is a .gb or .gbk. This is called the GenBank flat file. And OK, so DFAST, as said, is incredibly fast. It produces a vast variety of different file formats, which you will find useful as you grow to learn how they, they, how they work. Plus, at the bottom, it says the stats. So it tells you the length, which, of course, you knew when you put it in, the GC content, the number of coding sequences, number of tRNAs, and the coding ratio. That is the, uh, we'll deal with this a little later, is the total length of all the CDSs and tRNAs expressed over the length of the phage genome. Okay. Now, comments on, on, on auto annotation. Should you blindly accept the auto annotation results? No. Why? Because, in fact, the programs are only adequate in defining the correct initiation codons. They're only adequate at defining the product function, but they're bad at identifying small coding sequences. And that's because these programs are trained for working with bacterial genomes, not uh, phage genomes. And phage genomes, as I mentioned, frequently have very, very small open reading frames. And a couple of examples of this are a Lambda RAL and Lambda NIN and SF6, which are, you know, so 75 nucleotides, ideal. Correct the wrong initiation codon. So here we have initiation codon. Upstream, we have the ribosome binding site. You want to make sure that, in fact, the ribosome binding site is upstream from the nucleotides trimer that you've chosen. You need to, in fact, then correct the names of annotated genes. And unfortunately, when you do this, occasionally you get a messy uh, report. This is a good looking GenBank flat file. Uh, I apologize, it's also one that I produce. So, okay, so number one, you want a good title. And a good title is the host genus plus phage plus the phage name and then complete genome. That's a good title. What's a bad title? Well, bacteriophage LKD16, complete genome, specific host Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That is the bad title. You want, that phage should have been called Pseudomonas phage LKD16. The second thing you want to know when you're looking at the GenBank flat file is, does it say linear up here? If it says circular, you know that the people who have annotated it are not phage experts, and uh, because there are no large phages which have circular genomes so far. Okay. In addition, you want to see that, in fact, there's a nice uh, description of the products. And if regulatory sequences are given, you want to see that promoters and terminators, plus you want to see what sort of approach that people take to, in fact, identify these. So there's a software called FIRE, which I'll be mentioning later, Arnold, which I'll also mention later. And I generally look for promoters by doing a screen, which you'll again see the software, which one can use for that. OK, plus on any GenBank flat file, you need the locus tag. And these are identifiers which are uh, used in every sequencing project. And unless your phage is, name is P1, which hopefully it isn't, you can use your phage name as the locus tag. 
And I regret to say that in the case of RAST, DFAST, and Patrick, they, as far as I know, they do not add locus tags. So when you get the automatic annotation back, you're going to have to massage it. And you're going to have to do this to remove spiritless material, material which you really don't want to submit to GenBank. And you're going to also have to correct the auto annotation errors. And so this is uh, what I mean by messy. This was a GenBank flat file produced in RAST, opened in Notepad. And you really can't see it clearly. So I opened it in WordPad, and it looks much more normal. But in fact, there are a whole series of problems with it. One is the definition line is wrong. OK, it says contig your senior from a senior phage. Uh, sorry, that's not a, the appropriate definition. In addition, it contains all sorts of spurious information about me and the taxon which they think it is. So you want to, in fact, delete. You want to rework that. You want to delete all of this. And then it doesn't have anything, any information on the gene number or the locus tag, locus tag being the more important of the two. And you want to then remove these things or replace them with locus tag numbers. And that can be done quite easily with, with these ones because all you do is select the portion here. Oops, sorry, back here go. Is select the portion from the forward slashed to the peg period and just do replace with an underscore with your locus tag. Work perfectly. And the last problem that I see here is something which is quite common in annotated phage genomes. The product is a phage protein. Well, duh, all the proteins in a phage are phage proteins. So that is should always be replaced with hypothetical protein. And you can do that quite nicely, at least in, in Word, uh, in, in PC computers using um, um, uh, WordPad or, or um, Notepad. And you end up with something which looks perfect. OK, so as I mentioned, that, that's the first thing you would do is clean up your automatic annotation uh, file. The second thing you want to do is you want to be able to look at the DNA and say, have all my open reading my coding sequences been identified and have they been identified correctly? And there are several programs which you can use. Uh, Artemis is old and reliable. DNA Master is used by the CFage group extensively. I really like Eugene uh, because it's updated continually and it's available for all types of computers. And there are commercial programs available, including Genius. Basically, you want a program which will show you the DNA sequence and at the same time, the translated protein sequence. So I'm not going to actually show you the data from Eugene. I'm going to show you the data from a program which I use called Codon, uh, which is brilliant, but uh, I can't afford to update it because the updated cost is prohibitive. But if I had, you know, $30,000, I might consider, which I didn't have anything better to do with, I might consider buying it. OK, so in this case, you can see the DNA sequence. You can find the coding sequences in the diagram below. And what you're looking for are gaps. Where you see a gap, even this little gap down here, you should be suspicious. You should say, is there something missing in that gap? Because in many cases, these genomes look like this, one open reading, one coding sequence after another. So I can go into, in this particular program, tools, open reading frame, and I get something like this. So the first point is, essentially, there's nothing of interest in this region here. There's a couple of small open reading frames, but are they real coding sequences? I don't know. There seems to be something missing here. And the question here is, is this the correct initiation site? I mean, we've got all this upstream sequence, which could have initiation sites in it. Is this the correct one? And in order to find that, what you want to do is, in fact, look upstream 
you want to select one of these things and look at the upstream sequence. So if we take the first one, which was completely missed, these are all the open re these are all the potential coding sequences. They all end at the same point, 3195, and they all begin at progressively uh, uh, shorter regions. So what I can do is I can click on the first one and say, show me the upstream sequence. And so I'm here's the initiation code on here, ATG at the DNA level, AUG at the RNA level. And I'm looking for, and in fact, found a very nice ribosome binding site. So in fact, I can then inform the program that I want to incorporate another open reading frame when another coding sequence at this point. Okay. So we've now, can, we've now gone through, we've edited out the spurious and incorrect information. We've made sure that each one of the open re coding sequences begins where it should, begins downstream from a ribosome binding site. And now we get to the point where we want to name these things. We're going to pause for five seconds while I get a cup of coffee. Great. Now, we're going to need to name these things. And as I've mentioned already, phage hypothetical protein or phage protein is redundant. Get rid of phage and just leave it as hypothetical protein. A lot of people use GP, which is a perfectly acceptable term for gene product, but gene 80. GP87, like GP200, means nothing. So please change them to hypothetical proteins. And I say that it means nothing because, in fact, I went and looked for GP200 in the protein database, and you end up with completely different proteins in all of these phase genomes. So please don't use it. If you want, you can always add a note to your uh, annotation uh, file, which is similar to GP43 from another page. That's perfectly acceptable. All of these terms, UBO, A, MCP, NRD, ORF184, uh, mean essentially nothing to anyone other than you. Um, and I've noticed a lot of people have started using hypothetical protein and then they have some sort of symbol, which is obviously is related to their locus tag. Please don't use that. Always, in this case, you would put hypothetical protein. OK, here's the bottom rule, is unless you're a bioinformatician or biostatistician, with, be very conservative in recording your hits. Could, could you convince your grandmother? Assuming your grandmother is not a molecular biologist or a bioprediction, if not listed as a hypothetical protein. That is probably the take home message for annotation. Be consistent and be conservative. And do not use putative. It doesn't mean what you think it means. And in fact, GenBank would rather not see putative given. OK, so here's there are a couple of sins. Uh, which you can commit. Number one is if you call a hypothetical protein a DNA polymerase with no or poor quality information, that's really bad. That's worse than calling a DNA polymerase a hypothetical protein. I call this laziness, but this is a real sin. It's a sin because it leads to misannotation creep. And certainly when you get to doing uh, practical bioinformatics and start doing BLAST-P searches, you will find that you may end up with 100 things which are called terminase and another one which is called DNA polymerase, and you go, that can't be right. Andrew's being muted. OK, I'm unmuted. Yep. Yes, Emily? we can hear you again. Perfect now. OK, good. No idea what happened. OK. OK, so as I said, be really cautious about employing blast hips in naming GPPs. You want to say, is there additional information which backs up my conclusion that this particular coding sequence encodes a DNA polymerase, a terminase, or whatever? 
Uh, last bit on cons trying to be consistent when naming things. These are taken from blast hits using uh, E. coli phage uh, T4 RNA, uh, sorry, R2A protein. And a number of them say R2A protein, which is great. But we even get things like hypothetical protein, not a hope in hell. That's pure laziness. Protein of unknown function, that's also uh, laziness. But I love this one here, unnamed protein product. Weird. OK. For useful information on uh, naming of your proteins, I would recommend the Uniprot's knowledge uh, base. Uh, which is linked here. And so if you use these terms with small letters, because that's what um, GenBank wants, you're doing, going to do fine. And Viral Zone is another good source for information on, on naming proteins, and especially for ones which are you're working on, say, a T7-like phage or a T4-like phage. OK, so as I said uh, before, committing yourself to the, the BLAST, uh, homology hit, you want to be use other tools to, in fact, confirm what you think you, your protein actually is. And for this, there are a number of tools which will screen protein motif databases. But in order to do this, you, in fact, need to extract from your GBK file the proteins that enco are encoded by your phage. And there are a number of tools on the internet. The sequence manipulation suite is useful, but occasionally it doesn't name a number of the proteins, which is annoying. This is probably the best site that I've found, this genome 2, uh, 2D conversions uh, um, suite of programs in the Netherlands. And if you take, choose, if you upload your GBK file and choose GenBank to proteins, it'll give you um your proteins in faster format okay so as i mentioned again don't trust blast p hits look for protein motifs and there are three tools on the web which i strongly recommend one is the batch protein sequence this one here which is an ebi which offers you one two three four five at least six databases of motifs to look for. But I would also, before you do this, run it on this, I would recommend that if you're not a bioinformatician, that you use an E value of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, minimum 10 to the minus 5 better, and only record the results which are positive. Another one is batch web CD at uh, NCBI. Again, use very conservative approaches. And the last one is interpro query page. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't give you e-values for the hits. OK, so again, be very cautious in interpreting, interpreting results and employ the grandmother rule. And be consistent. So you want to apply the same rules to interpreting every single protein, even though, so if the if it doesn't fit with the E value you've picked, then it's a hypothetical protein. You can always add a note. I think it might be, well, you don't want to put that, but you want to say similar to whatever from another phage. Right. Another tool that I tend to use when looking at my proteins is to scan them for transmembrane domains. This is particularly useful if you're dealing with holins and related type of proteins. And I would recommend strongly that you use two tools uh, when scanning and compare the results of both of the tools. So I'm recommending TMNH, TMH, MM. Uh, why? Because it's a well-respected program and it also gives you a nice looking diagram, which is easily to interpret. So you have probability of helices, membrane helices here and here, which makes sense because it's a whole. The other good tool is Phobius, which again gives you the same protein, exactly the same results. If they both agree, uh, you can record your protein as a hypothetical membrane protein. If they disagree, if one says zero and one says one, 
I would, I would just leave it as hypothetical protein. If one says two and one says three, then you could in fact say hypothetical membrane protein and then add a note about the number of transmembrane domains which were found with each of the programs. Okay, if, you're, if it's a holin, you can in fact record it as a holin and then add note to transmembrane domains discovered using TMHMM and Phobius. Okay, so these are, those are the sort of basic tools you should use. Occasionally, it's, you'd like to know more about proteins and you can use, um, uh, you can use this program. Yeah, I have to move this. HPRED, uh, which in fact searches a protein structural database with the sequence of your phages. Unfortunately, it only allows analysis of a single protein at a time, and it takes a fair while usually to run through it. If you are interested in running, you know, 200 proteins, you probably want to download the program and its database and run it on your computer. And you want to, in fact, re only retain information where the probability is at least 90%, and ideally the hit is to a phage protein. So let's take a look at an example. So this is a bacillus palma phage uh, protein, which is defined in GenBank as a DUTPase. And how is, is the data good for that or not? Let's take a look. So if we run BLAST P, we can either run it against the non-redundant databases or we can run it against viruses, tax ID database. And we look at hits, we look at motif hits first. And we find that these three protein data, protein motif databases, PFAM, CD, and COG, all record essentially that it is a DUTPase. And the probability values, the E values here are very high. So when this happens, I think you can, without uh, any further ado, say that this is a DUTPase. If these values are less than minus five, then you should in fact move on. So low, v, low E values hits to three protein motif databases, very good. HHPRED, we've got these red bars which indicate high probabilities and high low E values. And again, in the, phase, the, the first two, they're both the UTP aces, DUTP aces. They're from bacteria, or well, one's from bacteria, one from another creature. Um, so, but I think that the evidence is such that it's these high scoring hits, it will be, you would have complete confidence in recording this as a DUTP ace. In addition, the H8 PRED provides you the structure that this homology search is run against. And this particular protein can be visualized in NCBI or in the, the protein database. Okay, so the bottom line, there's really good evidence based on homology, more on motifs, on H8 PRED analysis, that this is a DUTPase. But if you couldn't convince your grandmother that the protein is a DUTPase, please refer to us as a hypothetical protein. That's the bottom line for annotation. Does your annotation stop here? Well, it depends on what you're interested in. If you're interested in your phage as a therapeutic agent, then no, it doesn't stop here because in fact, you want to in fact screen it for minimally for toxins and maybe for antimicrobial resistance proteins. And toxins and virulence factors, there are a number of sites available on the internet uh, for screening things. Unfortunately, most of these only allow analysis of single protein we run at a time. I'll come back to how we get around this problem in a moment. In the case of antimicrobial resistance, the CARD database from the University of Master in Canada is probably the best one. But in any one of these things, you want to use considerable amount of, of skepticism when in fact viewing the results. So not all virulence factors are toxins and not all um, 
antimicrobial resistance proteins are in fact, the people have found are in fact resistance. Okay, so uh, to allow you to do a batch analysis, uh, I would recommend, and unfortunately it only works with um, Mac, uh, win Windows computers, is a little program called BioEdit, uh, which is designed for uh, sequence alignments. I have never used it, the sequence alignments. I use it because in fact, it has a built-in BLAST program. And I will provide, have provided you with a, an extensive list of toxins from the virulence factor database. And in fact, you can create your own protein database in this. All you do is open up the program, go to accessories, choose BLAST, create a protein database, and then use the bacterial toxins.fast database, which I provided with you for you. And you will now be able to do BLAST searches against that database, either singly or multiply. So when I open BioEdit and choose local BLAST, this is what I see. And unfortunately, it has a number of, of uh, defaults, which you really don't want to use. Well, one is BLAST N, which in fact will then go against Clostridium perfringens, uh, which is one of mine. And the E value is extraordinarily high or low, depending on which, how you view this. So you want to change some of these things. So what I've done here is I've changed the, the program to BLAST P. I've added the bacterial toxins database to the protein database. And I can either paste all my proteins or upload all my proteins. And I've changed the expect value to 10 to minus four. And in fact, it will run all of the proteins, all of your proteins relatively quickly. And this is what you don't want to see. You don't want to see a hit like this to an enterotoxin from Clostridium perfringens. You want to see essentially no homology all the way down. Okay. Okay. Other sites which might prove useful. Um, okay. Occasionally, programs don't like the look of your GenBank flat file. And I would recommend any one of these three programs, particularly this one here, GBK to Seekin, uh, which in fact will upload your sequence, your annotated sequence, and then you can download it, but it's being massaged to remove uh, crap. Two little questions, and which um, uh, you might want to answer. The first is, what percentage of the genome is involved in coding for proteins and tRNAs? And what is the coding codon usage? Okay. In order to do this, you need what is known as an FFN file, which is essentially all your genes in FASTA format. And again, I would recommend strongly the Genome 2D. We're going from uh, GenBank to genes in FASTA format. So in fact, we will take your GenBank and it will produce a long file here with every one of your genes listed, sequence, and the FASTA symbol at the top. What you want to do is to open up um, Notepad or similar type of editor and remove the FASTA line. So you'll end up with, in fact, a giant protein with stop codons in it, uh, all in the same open reading frame uh, for your entire genome. And the ratio of the total size of this to the size of the phage genome will give you an indication of the coding uh, capacity of your phage, which should be about 0.9. Uh, one phage I worked on early on had a coding capacity of 1.3, which was, you know, but it had open reading frames overlapping with open reading frames. For codon usage, so this is, this will give you the answer to the first question. In the second question, you can use any of the following uh, programs online, which will tell you what the codon usage is for your particular virus. I would recommend doing this only if you have tRNAs in your genome. And yeah, okay. Lastly, terminators and promoters. 
Do you need to include these? No, but it's sometimes nice to do it, particularly if you have a T7-like phage. If you have one of the members of the autography uh, viridae, I would definitely recommend looking at terminators and promoters. Okay, terminators are the sites of RNA pausing, RNA polymerase pausing and transcriptional termination. Where are they located? They'll be located downstream or at the end, the three prime end of your CDSs. That's where you normally find them. Now, I will admit that occasionally I find them right in the middle of a gene. Uh, things which occur in the middle of genes like promoters or terminators, I view with considerable suspicion. And I really think that they should be ignored unless you've done RNA-seq analysis. There's two types, terminators. The only one I'm gonna mention is the row independent ones. The reason I like these ones is that in fact, there are programs which will look for them and they have a structure, a structure in the RNA and a structure in the DNA, which is a downstream poly T rich region, upstream stem loop structure, which is high in GC, and then, then that's the end of the gene. Okay. There are several programs. My favorite is Arnold. Uh, looking at terminators, also fine terminators. It's a well-respected one as well. And once you discover one, you in fact want to use a program called mfold, which again is, I think, one of the oldest programs uh, on the internet for doing uh, DNA structural analysis. And you want to use that to examine your structure better. Okay, so here's the Arnold output. It has upstream sequence. It has the up loop, sorry, the up stem, the loop, the down stem, and then the downstream sequence. And you want to look at these things critically and you want to choose out for further analysis those which have a delta G of minus 10 or less and ones which in fact have lots of T's and A's on the downstream region. And you want to, in fact, uh, trim uh, the ones you're interested in to from the upstream stem to the last of the T's that you want to include. Do not present Arnold data in papers because yep, this um, first bit of sequence is irrelevant. Okay, so this is the M fold. Again, you can see the stem loop structure and the downstream sequence. Okay, in the case of promoters, these are the sites of RNA polymerase binding and transcriptional uh, termination, uh, sorry, initiation, which is the plus one site. There's no zero site on the nucleotide. And like terminators, they're located downstream in intergenic regions and at the three prime end of sequence. And if you ever are working in phases which have divergent transcriptional units, you know there has to be a promoter which is going to the right and then another one going to the left. The two types that we're going to see are host RNA polymerase dependent promoters and phage RNA dependent promoters. But if you're seriously interested in promoters and terminators, you really should consider doing RNA-seq analysis on your virus. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay, that seems to make perfect sense. Okay. When you come to the host RNA polymerases, the usual, uh, what it says is TDGACA, this is the minor 35 recognition, recognition um, site, and 15 to 18, it actually should be 19. I've done studies which show 19 works nice. Most of the ones are 17 plus or minus two, I should say here. Okay. Uh, promoters vary in strength and sometimes include a couple of extra bits which are worth reporting on. One is an upstream sequence, which is a poly A type region upstream from the minus 35. And there's an extended minus 10 in the case of T4 phages, which is a TGN upstream from the TATAT sequence. That, those are the early promoters in T4, and 
uh, regular type phages. The, in the case of larger phages, the middle and late type promoters are a lot more difficult to find. Phage encoded promoters, such as the T7 ones, are completely different from the previous ones. The previous ones are host dependent ones. And T7 is a 23 uh, base mirror um, and can be expressed as the web logo. Okay, to find the phage ones for T7 like phages, I recommend fire. This is a go to, for lunch or go on coffee break type of program because it's a, it is very, very slow. And any one of you who are uh, interested in programming, it would be lovely if you would turn this into an internet resource uh, for those of us who work on T7 like phages. Okay, you, there are also a number of tools online for looking at phage like pro, uh, promoters. Um, and in order to do this, most of them require the DNA sequence alone, or a minority will take GBK files. Ones that take GBK files are the preferred ones. One of them is this computational microbiology lab, is you can actually add the sequence with a two after it, which indicates you're only interested in two mismatches. So this is these are my rules when reporting promoters is I will accept promoters where there's two mismatches within the uh, minus 35 and minus 10 recognition regions. If you want to use three, fine. Um, but you know, please, when recording it in GenBank, say how many mismatches you've allowed. Um, University of Mino, they've come up with a new program called Phage Promoter, which isn't perfect yet, but it certainly is, is useful. I will say that, uh, and this is illustrated nicely here, is that you will find, if you just use DNA sequence, you will find promoters all over the place. So this is Genome 2D. It gives you two options. One is just the DNA sequence, and number two is with the GenBank flat file. If, so in the case of the uh, GBK file, sorry, in the case of the DNA sequence file, we've got all of these potential promoters. But if we go only with the, the GenBank flat file, we've only got these ones identified. So again, this is the case where we've got, in, in, in fact, over here, we've got potential promoters in the middle of genes. And until you do RNA-seq analysis, we really, really won't know whether these are true promoters or just artifacts. OK, one last tool um, is for looking at interesting repeat sequences and potentially promoters is the meme suite, uh, which is accessible at these two points. And ideally speaking, in order to run this, you don't want to run it on the whole DNA. You want to run it with the upstream sequence from your DNA. And you want to select probably at least 10 motifs. Otherwise, use the default settings. And you will get the results by email. OK, so in order to get the upstream sequence, I've provided you with a Perl script called Extract Upstream DNA, which can, can, is part of a package of convert GBK um, programs. Or you can do the following. You can go to Danish Technical University and go to ex feature extract, select coding sequences, and then ask for 100 base pairs of upstream sequence. And you'll get this. So here's your coding sequence, ATG to TAA, and the upstream sequence are the ones in small letters. You then take this to the sequence manipulation suite, and you paste it in, and you say, I want the first 103 nucleotides, and that's what you get. You get the upstream sequence plus the initiation codon. And if you send this off to meme, get analysis, this is the sort of result that you will get. You will get often cases, the initiation code on and the ribosome binding site, plus you will get other information. 
And this is where the problem is that you ask yourself, well, does this look like anything I've ever seen before? And the answer is maybe not, but it seems to be present in a number of sites on my genome and at a sufficiently good uh, expect value. So you will find, because you've asked to see, say, 10 different motifs, you will see things that you recognize, and you will definitely see things you don't recognize. And there's the point where we will end for questions. I will point out there before you, this is the resident therapy dog. Uh, I should mention, and I'm sure that it probably hasn't been mentioned so far, not covered, but there are basic properties of phage genomes that you should, in fact, uh, record. Obviously, the size, the GC content, worth doing a GC plot because you've got certain points on this genome where there's got really low GC. Restriction sites you might be interested in, skew analysis you might be interested in, and direct repeats you might be interested in. The problem with repeats is that you have to explain what they are. Okay, so I will end there and I will answer any questions. Anyone has any?